Olga. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's session. And my name is Olga Bodhi, and I'm a Syngap parent of a 13-year-old boy, and I um, am a part of Syngap Research Fund. We're very excited to continue the SRF Syngap Research series, webinar series. And the goal of the series is getting you closer to the science of Syngap, make you aware of the research that has been done and the opportunities to participate, empower your communications with clinicians as you get more clear knowledge of Syngap. We also want to give a plug for our next presentation, uh, which is SYNGAP1 Scientific Conference um, on February 19th at 8, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our talk for today is Behavioral and Cellular Pathophysiology in a Rat Model of SYNGAP1 Helpo Insufficiency. I have the pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Peter Kind. Hello. Professor Kind is a director of the Simmons Initiative for the Developing Brain at the Patrick Wild Center for Research into Autism, Fragile X Syndrome, and Intellectual Disability, and Professor of Developmental Neuroscience at the University of Edinburgh. He is also Associate Director at the Center for Brain Development and Repair at the Institute of Stem Cell Biology and Representative Medicine in Bangalore, Bangalore India. Professor Kine completed his postdoctoral training uh, with Professor Colin Blakemore at Oxford University and Professor Susan Hockfield at Yale University. Professor Kine received his PhD from Oxford University in 1993 and he joined the University of Edinburgh in 2020. The Kine Laboratory examines the cellular and circuit dysfunction associated with monogenic forms of moderate to severe neurodevelopmental disorders. The laboratory focuses on the development of synaptic function and how altered developmental Development leads to the circuit and behavioral phenotypes associated with rat and mouse models of these disorders. By comparing these disorders with several different genetic alterations, we aim to determine whether distinct genetic causes of intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder share common pathologies that may be amenable to similar therapeutic approaches. We are truly grateful for the work uh, Peter has done in the interest in SYNGAP. After this brief introduction, I will let you know a recorded version of this webinar will be available on the SRF website, syngapresearchfund.org. By the end of this presentation, you will have the opportunity to get to answer your questions. We'd love to hear from you. Please write your questions in the chat. For those of you just joining us, welcome. And again, our speaker is Dr. Peter Kind and his talk is Behavioral and Cellular Pathophysiology in a rat model of Syngap-1 health insufficiency. It is now my pleasure to turn over to Professor Kine. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. I just realized that my computer is about to die, so I'm just gonna plug it in. Um, well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It actually is a very great pleasure to be able to speak to you today. In fact, I think this in some ways is the most important aspect of what we do is going back into the communities and, and helping to educate on what we know, what the science is teaching us about, in this case, SYNGAP1 haploinsufficiency. Um, so I will share my screen now. And I will say also to uh, hello to um, all, all the families and actually friends out there um, I see Gavin has joined. Hi, Gavin. It's been a long time through COVID that we've been able to get together, but I look forward to when we can get together again and, and discuss and discuss science. Um, so, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm, I'm the director of the Patrick Wild Center um, and the Simons Initiative for the Developing Brain, and also and uh, Associate Director for the Center for Brain Development and Repair um, in Bangalore, India. That's led by Shona Chatterjee. And I'll briefly introduce these. I know Andy Stanfield spoke to you recently um, and introduced the Patrick Wild Center, which has been running now. This is our 10th year, actually. We've just passed a decade since we first formed. Um, and much more recently was the Simons Initiative for the Developing Brain. So I'll introduce these three centers briefly. So overall, my talk, Oops, I'm not sure why this is. 
my talk overview will follow these. So I'll start with um, the Simons Initiative for the Development Brain and PwC and explain who we are. Then I'll go into our approach. Um, then I'll talk to you a little bit about why we have moved pretty heavily to the RAP model, although we still use most models of SYNGAP1, haploid insufficiency, but we're moving mainly to the RAT. And um, today's talk will focus on the behavioral assessment of, of these animals in two different SYNGAP haploid insufficiency models. Um, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about the um, recent data we've received from, on EEG, um, in particular, um, the recordings that we've made and, and what we've learned about sleep and seizure um, phenotypes in these rat models. And finally, if, if time permits, I will tell you a little bit about Lovastat. And many of you may know that um, with David Wiley, we published a paper, gosh, six years ago now, comparing um, Fragile X and Syngap haploid insufficiency, um, and where we use Lovastatin to correct some of the phenotypes in the hippocampus. And so I'll briefly tell you where we've gotten with that. Um, okay, so I'll start with who we are and what approaches we take to trying to understand neurodevelopmental de disorders more generally. So this is the team. Um, and um, we, there's a wide range of us. Actually, we've grown by several people um, in the last few years through recruitment. So we have about five young recruits that have joined the team um, to replenish all of us old guys and gals. Um, and I, what I thought I'd highlight here in this slide is, is everybody in red that I've just highlighted in red are people that are working on Syngap1, have at least one project in their, in their lab investigating Syngap1. So it's one of the main genes we focus on um, in SIDB. So SIDB launched as a result of a large donation from Jim and Marilyn Simons, a large grant from, from the Simons Foundation or Safari um, that allowed us to all come together and to really focus on the autisms but the neurodevelopmental disorders more generally. And some of you may recognize some of the people here. Here's David Wiley, who I believe has spoken um, at your group. Stuart Cobb, who leads our gene therapy um, fundamental research program. Andy, of course, who's who spoke recently. And then there's a range of people that you may not know that work on behavior or the molecular biology. This is Shona Chatterjee, who leads the center in Bangalore. Natalie Rashfor, who does all the circuit biology. Some of you may know Emily Osterweil, who works at the molecular end, as does Mike. And Adrian Bird, who doesn't work directly on Syngap, but has guided a lot of our research um, through his work on Rett syndrome. So, that's who we are and when we formed. Um, I should also make a big call out to um, Bangalore, India, because this is where we do a lot of our work, a lot of our fundamental basic work on the behaviors associated with these um, neurodevelopmental disorders. That's where we had the behavior pipeline, which I'll refer to um, in, in an upcoming slide. But unlike Edinburgh, it is always sunny in Bangalore. And if anybody would like to come visit us out there, that would be great. We probably will be closing down the site in a year and moving everything to Edinburgh um, because Shona Chatterjee will be moving. But anytime, if we can ever travel again in the next year, it would be great to have you visit us out there and, and see the um, Institute out there. Um, so I always think it's important to really define what I mean by a neurodevelopmental disorder. These are disorders where the autisms, the intellectual disabilities, and the childhood epilepsies all overlap. And this is what our centers focus on. And there's a very good reason for why we focus on this severe end of the spectrum where these early neurodevelopmental disorders overlap. And that's because if you do exome or whole genome sequencing, if a child is presented to a clinic with a neurodevelopmental disorder, um, before the age of two, typically, or even up to the age of four, and you do whole genome or whole exome sequencing, there's about a 60% chance that you will find a monogenic cause to that. You will find a genetic disruption that you can attribute to, to the, to, as causal to the disorder. And this came out of work um, of the development of this, um, 
uh, what's the, the DDD study, which is Deciphering Developmental Disorders, which is a UK and Ireland wide study, but it's similar to the studies that have been run by the by Safari, where they've really looked into the genetic underpinnings of, of autism. And, and when autism goes hand in hand with intellectual disability, there tends to be a monogenic cause. Um, and Syngap and Fragile X are perfect examples of this. Now, in our center, we study a range of rat models and that I've just put up on, on the right-hand side. One of the reasons why we focus so heavily on Syngap, is, well, there's multiple reasons. One is it's of all the monogenic disorders, it's one of the most prevalent. Um, but also we've been, I've been working on Syngap since 2005. I think I published my first paper on Syngap. And so we've been working on it long before we even knew that it was a gene that was causally related to neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and it was the second rat model we made. Um, I think we originally made the rat model in about 2014, 2015, um, the first rat model, um, at following on from the, from the Fragile X rat model. Um, so why do we study this many genes? Well, because even though these are their own syndromes or their own disorders, um, really we can learn, what we learn from one can tell us a lot about the other and can help us guide our research into the other. And this was really summarized um, from in multiple reviews that when the genetics started to be being revealed around 2011 were the first genetics papers that really looked into them through the genetic basis of neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, um, they came up with the, they realized that these genes were not unrelated. And in fact, they clustered around particular biological process or, or biochemical pathways. So you can see um, the synaptic function represented here and there's Syngap sitting in here. You can see the chromatin remodeling genes is where Rett syndrome would fall into um, MECP2 as the gene, or CHD8, which is the most common monogenic cause of, of autism. But you can see what the size of the dots represent on this hairballs-like structure is the prevalence. And you can see that Syngap1 uh, is one of the most prevalent. And we wanted to really ask the question, well, does this genetic convergence predict phenotypic convergence? So if we have two different models that give us a similar, um, that where the genes are located in similar biological processes or, or bio, biochemical pathways, would they look similar? And that's been the main focus of the work out of Bangalore. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that. I'm happy to discuss it because we've run a lot of different animals through the pipeline. Um, but today I'm just thought I'd just focus on what we know about Syngap1 and a lot of this stems from what we found initially in Bangalore, but is what we've been really studying here in Edinburgh. So how do we go about, when we have a rat model, how do we go about looking at it? And the classic way that scientists do this is they start, they use a bottom-up approach. They start by understanding what the molecule is doing at the synapse in the brain, or it might be located in a glial cell, how, um, what it's doing in an astrocyte, for, so for example, but in Syngap, for Syngap, we already knew from the work of Mary Kennedy, Rick Huguenier, Seth Grant, that it was a, a very important synaptic molecule. So we can start asking, how does the loss of Syngap start affecting synapses? How does that affect the cellular physiology and anatomy? How does that go on to affect circuit function? And finally, how does that affect behavior? And this is the classic way that scientists go about um, study, um, studying these disorders. We took a slightly different approach. Actually, we do a lot of the bottom-up approach, but we also do what I'll refer to as a top-down approach. That is to start with the behavior and then work back to the circuit and then move to the cell and so on. And the reason for doing this is we've often been very much hindered by our behavioral analysis. And we thought that might be a good place to start so we have a reliable output from the whole system that we can then try to correct. The other reason being is many of these may turn out to be neurodevelopmental disorders. And it might be that the best therapeutic approach for older kids or adults might be to actually try to target the circuit. If we can really understand the circuit function, 
you might be able to target that and at least try to alleviate some of the more um, disabling behaviors associated with the disorder. So for both of those reasons to try to allow a convergence of the data coming from the circuit and behavior with the molecular and the cell, as well as to try to perhaps come up with circuit-based targets, we do both the top-down and the bottom-up approach. Um, and we also look at a range of brain areas. So we don't focus on one brain area. The typical, um, quite often people focus on the, the hippocampus, but many of us like Gavin included, look for a range of brain areas to try to really get, because we don't want to end up with a function that's specific to the hippocampus. And I might come back to that at the end in terms of lovastatin um, as to why that's important. So we look at a range of brain areas and we try to always keep development in mind. These are, whether they're developmental disorders or problems of neural maintenance, irrespective, they arise during development. And it's really important if we want to understand how the circuit is functioning, it's really important to understand um, how that circuit developed and how the individual cells developed and synapses developed. So in, my lab, but also in, in SIDB more broadly, we use a range of techniques in order to address this. So we use everything from RNA-seq and proteomics. We're focusing heavily now in SIDB on genetic rescue, like the type of things that Gavin's done in the mouse. Um, at the cellular level, we use electrophysiological and anatomical techniques in order to really understand the neuronal morphology and understand the structure function relationship between the cellular morphology and the cell function. And if you think about what a neuron has to do, it's pretty remarkable. It receives thousands of inputs, synaptic inputs onto its dendrites. Somehow it has to integrate all that information and pass it down to the axon. So it has a huge integrative property, properties that lead to its proper function. And we know that Syngap and Fragile X can alter the way that dendrites integrate this information. And then it has to decide how to pass on that information in the form of action potentials. And how it does that can also be affected. And how the axons conduct elect the electrical currents can also be affected. So this, this is a huge interest of ours. Um, at the circuit level, we use a range of techniques like two photon imaging, single and multi-unit recordings, but the ones I'm going to, uh, and fMRI, which I might touch on at the very end, but also EEG, which I will talk a bit about um, in, the, in this talk. But the main focus on this talk is, as I mentioned, is the top-down approach to really develop an ethogram to understand the animal's behavior in the best way that we can understand rat behavior. And I'll touch on all of these different aspects of rat, rat behavior from the social to the cognitive to the emotional. Um, I won't talk about the sensory motor today, but we're very interested in how they integrate sensory information and turn that into a motor output. Okay, so why the rat? So, and which models have we generated of SYNGAP1 haploinsufficiency? So we've, although a lot of people look at a rat and say, this rat just looks like a big mouse. Why would you bother with the rat? The rat is very good for specific reasons and in no way in anything I'm saying in this talk, please don't take away that I don't think mice are an excellent model as well for studying neurodevelopmental disorders. Mice are also good, but rats are very different species and they have their advantages just like mice have their advantages. So from the rat's point of view and from a top-down approach point of view, Rats have much more cognitive flexibility than mice. And what that allows us to do, they're much easier to train on a lot of tasks and they give us a range of cognitive tasks that we can address that are much more difficult to do in mice. Rats are highly social animals and I'll come back to this, but mice, um, so rats tend to live in large, large groups of up to 150 animals um, and they have developed a range of social um, abilities that mice just don't because mice have developed as much more loner animals and tend to fight off other animals who want to enter into their territory. Um, and for things like MRI, rats are um, a lot easier to use because they just have bigger brains and the resolution of the techniques just suit bigger brains better. And a rat is not as good as a human for MRI, for example, but at least the rat brain is large enough 
that we can start doing functional MRI um, in these animals. Uh, a lot of pharmaceutical companies keep telling me that they would love to have access to our rats and we do collaborate with them because the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the rat is much closer to a human than that of a mouse. And there's other practical regions like they give very large litter size so we can always get control animals within a litter. But coming back to some, oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that all of our rat models that I'll be talking about and everyone that we've generated are on outbred strains. So one of the advantages of that has always been taken in mice of using mice is they were on inbred strains so the genetics is very homogeneous. And that allows you to really understand the impact of a particular mutation that you induce. Um, whereas we're interested in behavior, we're trying to get the full spectrum of behavior that um, comes out of these animals. So no two animals are genetically have a genetically identical background. And we keep these animals as outbred as possible to at least try to mimic the human population a bit better. Um, and I do just to emphasize that rats are not um, just big mice. Um, they separated in evolution actually about 12 million years ago. And if you compare that to when we separated from the chimpanzees, that's about 6 million years. So the difference between um, rats and mice um, in terms of evolutionary is by 6 million years separated them more than what separated the chimpanzees from, from the homo sapiens. So, okay, so, and so what that allows us to, it gives us a great advantage because these are very different species. Anything we see in a mouse or rat, in a mouse, we can always cross validate that um, in a different species by just going to the rat um, and vice versa. And uh, you'll probably be happy to know that most of the things that we find in both Syngap and Fragile X and typically wherever we've done the comparison is at the cellular physiology level anyway, everything that has been described in the mouse is very similar not in the rat. They're not always identical, but they're always very similar. And I'm happy to discuss why they're not identical, but um, I think that's for very explainable reasons. So what rat models do we have? Well, you've probably seen a lot of schematics like this, looking at the, the genetic, um, the, the Syngap gene. And um, we decided, and then down below, you can see where all of the different genetic alterations occur, different types of genetic alterations from the truncating variants to the splice variants to the missense and in frame um, variants. So the big difference between these is these lead to loss of function, possibly through um, complete loss of the gene. And we've made one rat model to mimic that. So a rat model where you just don't have one copy of Singa. Um, we've made a second rat model. You can see all of these point mutations, the majority of which, and I, this is probably not a completely up-to-date figure, but the majority of these do not um, lead, likely don't lead to a loss of Singa, but lead to um, uh, altered function of Syngap, either because they're in the C2 domain or the RAS gap domain. So we made a model that lacks the C2 and the RAS gap domain. And I'm not gonna have time to show much from that model. I'm mainly, or sorry, I'm not gonna have time to show much from the um, complete deletion. I'm gonna be mainly focusing on this um, PH2 and RAS gap domain loss because that's the model that we initially made. And I'm not going to show the characterization of it yet. That's um, in, in a paper that is currently on bioarchive. But um, suffice it to say that the protein is made in the same levels and it still gets to the synapse. So it, it could serve all of its structural functions, but it lacks the, enzyme, the main enzymatic functions of Syngap. OK, so that's th that section. Now I'm going to move on to some data. Um, and I'll. I'm gonna, as I mentioned, this talk will mainly focus on the behavior from the rat model. And I'll step through the various types of behaviors we do as examples. Um, and really, I'm, I, what I would love, this is where I would really love feedback to see if any of these ring true with um, what you see in, in your kids. So I'll start, um, I should, this is where I'll come back to the rat um, 
sort of what we call the behavior pipeline. So the rat behavioral phenotyping. And this is all done in Bangalore. So we run all of our animals and both the Syngap models have gone through this pipeline as well for a range of tasks. And the reason why all of these tax, tasks were chosen were because um, they tap into particular circuits. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we wanna tap into a range of brain areas, a range of circuits so that we really, if we see a, um, a change in the behavior in, on any of these tasks, we, it will give us an insight into what brain regions might be involved and what brain regions we might focus on for more bespoke experiments. You can see that we do these across Edinburgh and Bangalore um, and it's constantly changing. So for example, this was not the original pipeline. The, all, everything in red are things that we've changed during over the lifetime of this pipeline, which has now been running for about four years. And I'm happy to share all of this behavior with, with any researchers who might be interested in using the rat. So they can start, and we send the rat out even before we, all the rats out before we even publish them to get the community to take them up. Um, so they don't have to wait till we publish. We're happy to, to share them. And, and indeed the first paper from the full knockout came from Mary Kennedy's lab. We have not published on it yet, but we sent the rat to Mary and we um, published a paper with her and put the characterization of that rat in that paper. We're not interested in, in protecting these rats. We're more interested in them getting, getting used for the community that we look at them as a resource for the community. Okay, so the first bit of data I'll show you, it really taps into the emotional domain. And we, for this, we use a very old paradigm um, that's slightly tweaked. So it's called fear conditioning. Um, it's a way of associating a fearful stimulus in an animal with a, a non-fearful stimulus. And then looking at the, if the animal learns that association, the animal will then respond in a fearful way to the non-fearful stimulus. So it's a, it's a way of testing fear learning, or it's called fear conditioning. And classically you use a tone, but for various reasons, we change from using a tone to um, a visual stimulus. So here's the protocol we use. We habituate an animal to um, one chamber in a particular context. We then put them in a conditioning box and we pair mild foot shock um, with the flashing of a blue light. So we flash a blue light and at the end of, of that blue light, we give a mild foot shock. And then we do this six times in this particular paradigm. And then we place the animal back in this neutral context. And we just flash the blue light. So now there's no foot shock. And we look to see the animal's response. Does it show the fearful response? And the fearful response we look at is um, freezing. So animals will, all animals in the wild will typically choose one of three responses to fearful stimuli, which is freeze, flight, or fight. So, so they will either choose to fight an animal, um, they will make the choice to run away from the animal, or they'll make the choice to freeze. And in this paradigm, we're selecting for the animals that freeze by putting them in a box that they know they can't escape from. And the fearful stimulus is not something that they can fight against. So we, we want them to freeze and that's what they do in this paradigm. So here's the conditioning phase. So as this is when the animals are actually getting the shock and you can see initially they don't know what to do. Here's the six foot shocks. But by the third foot shock, they start freezing. And this is just percentage of time spent freezing. And in, in all my slides, Syngap is in blue and the wild type animals are in black. So you can see that both during the conditioning phase, both the wild types and the Syngap um, heterozygous animals, and this is all the gap deletion animals, gap C2 deletion, they freeze um, by the third foot shock and they're freezing 80% of the time. These are animals that are not, these are just control animals that have not been foot shocked and just placed back in the context of flashing blue light. And actually these animals, it looks like they're starting to freeze. Actually they're immobile, which is how we defined freezing. Um, and they're actually, 
many of them are just falling asleep. So here's the recall phase. So this important recall phase. So 24 hours later, we now put them back into the neutral context. So nothing about them reminds them of the foot shock in this context, but we flash the blue light and we flash the blue light 12 times. Okay, that's shown here. And this is the freezing response we get. So here's the wild type animal showing a typical response. You start flashing the light, the animal freezes because he thinks a foot shock is coming. And then, whoops. And then you can see that as the number of presentations of this in the absence of a foot shock increase, the animal starts to learn that this um, flashing light no longer predicts a shock and they stop freezing. And this is called an extinction. And the reason we use a mild foot shock in this case is so that we can study the extinction profile. If you use more um, stronger shocks, the even wild type animals will not stop freezing, but they quickly learn in this case that, they're, that, they're, that the blue light, blue flashing light is no longer associated and they learn that um, it's not indicative. They lose the association. Here's the Syngap animals. So you can see on the recall phase, they, they freeze a lot more and they really show very little extinction. They start to extinguish, but it takes a lot longer for them to extinguish this fear. So one of the possibilities is that they are showing a generalized fear that this paradigm induces a generalized anxiety or generalized fear in the Syngap animals, but that it doesn't do in the wild types. So there's a way we can look at that because we can look at these gaps in between. So these periods when the blue light isn't flashing and say, what is the animal doing during these gaps? And you can see that the wild type animals in the gaps, which are the dark shaded regions, they stop freezing. The blue light comes back on, they freeze and slowly they extinguish, but they always show this discrimination of the blue light, when the blue light's on and when the blue light's off. Interestingly, the syngaps also show this discrimination. So they have learned that the blue light is, is predictive of the, of the shock coming. It just takes them longer to distinguish that to extinguish that dissociation. And one of the interesting things, I'm just, I'm not gonna go into physiology except for this one, um, except for this one figure I'm about to show, but we know that the medial prefrontal cortex plays a critical role in the extinction. And when we look at LTP or a form of synaptic plasticity in the medial prefrontal cortex in animals of this age, we can see that the syngap um, animals show no long lasting increase in synaptic strength to a physiological stimulus, um, whereas the wild types do. So we can see alterations in the ability of the synapses to change in the medial prefrontal cortex of these animals. And this is how we start to get an idea of what the circuit alterations might be um, in the Syngap animals stemming from the behavior. So as we move back from the top down approach. Okay, so that's one phenotype that we've seen in the animals. We are very curious about another form of memory in these animals, which is a type of associative memory. And to give you an idea of what associative memory is, if you think back to one of your favorite birthday parties um, when you were young, and you might remember, oh, that was when I had a butterfly cake or a Superman cake, or that was that beautiful sunny day where all my friends and I went to a, the beach. That's a form of associative memory. So you associate now when you think of your early birthdays, you associate that with a particular context or a particular object, a cake. Now, for many of us, that's too long ago. So in my case, I more think in terms of, I remember I associate a bottle of Barolo wine, for example, with a particular restaurant in a particular region of France. I know the wine's Italian, but I was in La Garde de Frenet when I had my first bottle of Barolo, Barolo and I love Barolo. So I, whenever I think about Barolo, I immediately think of that restaurant in France. That's a form of associative memory. 
So how can we test associative memory in, in our animal models? So we can do it through changing context, changing objects, changing the place in which those objects are located and asking animals if they can remember it. And one of the beautiful things about this task is there's no, uh, there's no um, phase of learning that goes on to it. It's animals spontaneously explore um, novelty. They love to explore novelty. And we rely on that endogenous spontaneous um, activity or, or interest of animals to explore novelty. So the easiest version to understand of this task is object recognition. So if you give an animal a sample phase where they go in and they see two objects, two of the same object um, in, in a box, you remove it three minutes later, five minutes later, depending on the paradigm the next day, you can then put them in the same context and change one of the objects. And the animals will spend a lot more time exploring that object because it's novel to them. In this case, you can combine a novel object with uh, with a novel context. So this has three phases to it. You give one context in, represented by blue, one particular object record, represented by this Pac-Man figure. So you give them five minutes in here, five minutes, you give them a break, you put them in a no novel context and give them a novel object and they explore that object. Then you put them back in either of two, these two, in this case, it's a blue context. And you can see that they know, they've seen the Pac-Man in the blue context, but they've never seen the square in the blue context. So in order to explore this, if they explore this more, it means they've associated the context with the object. And they realize they've never seen that object in that context. You can do another form, which is object place, which I won't go into. I'll just focus on this last one, the object place context. Um, and I'll give you, I think the easiest way to do this is to show you a few videos. Um, and here's a rat in phase one. So there's two different objects in a particular context represented by the white walls. And you just see the animal exploring the two objects. He's getting ready. He, he's sort of understanding these two objects. He's interested in them because they're novel to him. And he's associating them with that context. Now here's an animal. These are the same objects, the same animal, phase two of it. And you can see that the objects haven't changed, um, but they're in a new place and they're in a new context. So the animal will explore the objects equally pretty much and will um, now associate this object in this place in this context. In the third phase, we give two of the same object. He knows this object from both of these contexts, but in the white context, the animal does not know this object in this place because this blue cylinder was in on the right-hand side in the white context, but now in the white context, it's in the left-hand side. He knows it in that place, but from the black context. And of course, I chose an example where the rat did incredibly well and spent the vast majority of its time exploring that novelty. So it has to bind together the object, the place, and the context. And this is obviously the hardest of the tasks. And this task we know relies on three different brain regions in particular and their connectivity, the lateral entorhinal cortex, the hippocampus, and the medial prefrontal cortex. So these objects, these other tasks don't rely on those, the object in place, the object in context relies on the hippocampus, for example, and this gives us an idea of where to start looking. Interestingly, when we looked at the Syngap animals um, in these four different paradigms, and we created a discrimination um, index, which is basically saying, how much more time do they spend with the novelty than the non-novelty? You can see that both the wild types and the knockouts, these triangles represent significance above chance levels. All of the animals, it doesn't matter the genotype, can do all of these discriminations, including the, the hardest one, the object place context. So they have, it appears that they have no problem um, with associative memory, forming associative memories. 
at least over the time frames, and that's a big caveat with all of these, over the time frames that we have tested them. If we test them longer, maybe they would lose it quicker or something, but over the time frames, and this is very distinctive from the fragile X animals, which can do all of these tasks, their development is delayed on the, on the object place, um, but it eventually comes on, but they can never do the object place context. Okay, so they never develop this ability. In contrast, the Syngap rats can. Okay, moving on to um, looking in the social domain. So for this, we use something called, we use a range of tasks for the social domain. I'm gonna actually show you um, the, what's called often referred to as the three chamber task. And in this task, what we do is the rats are put in a arena they're put in the middle of the arena and there's two chambers off to the side. And we start by habituating just to the, to the overall arena. We then add two upside down trash cans, which act as, um, as cages. Um, and we let them explore those so that the cages become, um, become familiar to them. And then we do, uh, oh, I was gonna show you actually what one of these looks like, this is exactly what it looks like. And this is an animal doing it. This is the test rat. And you can put rats, other rats, stimuli rats um, in these upside down cutoff um, trash cans, or you can um, put an animal and an object or an animal and nothing. So that's what we do here. We look for social interaction. If we just, does, the, does this test animal, um, which is, in this case will be a syngap heterozygous animal or a wild type animal moving around. And in this case, the stimulus animal is always a wild type animal. And we say, will it spend more time with the animal than it does with an empty cage? And another version of the task, which is social preference, will say, if we put, not so that there's novelty on both sides, we put an object on one side and an animal on the other and say, will this animal prefer to spend time with the animal, i.e. is it, will it show social preference above a novel object? And when we do that with the Syngap animals, here's what you see. And I'll take a second to go through this. So we basically ask, how much time does the animal spend sniffing either the animal in this presentation or the animal in, this, in the social preference? And this is the social interaction results, and this is the social preference results. So this is how much time they spend with the social over the empty cage. And you can see that both the wild types and the Syngap heterozygotes prefer to be with the animal. They prefer, they spend more time with the social, on the social side, than they do on the empty cage side. And similarly, both prefer to be, well, the wild types really prefer to be with the, um, uh, with the social animal. The syngaps show a preference, but this is not significant. And what these sociability indexes are, again, like the object index as I, um, object preference index I showed you before, this is saying how much time would they prefer spending relative to the other side, relative to the side that does not have an animal. And you can see when it's, an animal versus an open cage, both the wild types and the syngaps perform above chance in this, in the, in, in the sense that they want to spend more time with the animal, the social side. However, when you place an object in an animal in, the wild types still prefer to be with the, um, with the, with the social side, with the other rat. The heterozygotes, syngap heterozygotes, don't show a significant above chance. Now you can see that there's a lot of variability in the syngaps and this comes, this may come back. And if anybody wants to ask me about this, this may come back to the outbred nature of it where some animals can do it and some animals can't. And that's also true for the wild types, but in general, the wild types can perform above chance and the knockouts can't. Now, one of the really interesting things that we noticed in doing this is that in, in this task, the syngaps just always explored less the total time that they spent exploring the social side or the non-social side was much less than what the wild types did. So we went back and look at total exploration time in other tasks. 
And this is just showing two, but this is very typical of what we see in all of the behaviors that we see. Here's that associative memory task. And you can see it doesn't matter which task we're doing or which week we do it in, the syn gaps always explore less the objects than the wild types do. And here's a marble interaction task where we just put marbles in a cage and say, it's sort of um, looking at how animals, act, the exploration of animals. And you can see that the syn gaps are far less interested in a novel object just being placed in their cage, i.e. marbles, than the wild types. And in general, this is a, this is a general feature of the syn gap rats that they show a large decrease in their exploratory behavior. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch um, sort of modes a little bit. And I'm gonna not criticize these types of tasks, but talk about some of their limitations. So for all of these types of tasks that we take, we, what we do in these traditional behavioral testings is we take the animals out of this small cage that they live in, or relatively small cage that they live in, which, are, which obeys all ethical standards. And then we try a range of techniques. We ask them to do things and we associate what, they're, what these are telling us. So we devise these tasks specifically to look at their motor skills, if it's a rotor rod. Curiosity, here's a picture of that marble bearing uh, or marble interaction task I just talked to you about. Here's the associative memory tasks. And here's the social behaviors. These are, these are tasks that we've devised, or met, when I say we, I don't mean us, I mean the, the community has devised um, over the years to tap into different aspects of behavior. But there's issues with these traditional ways of testing. One, as I mentioned, it's restricted to experimental drive tasks and it may miss key phenotypes um, that the, these animals have, but we're just not testing. There's also a question in the field of whether we should be using moving to more ethologically valid tasks, i.e., what does the animal normal, what would a rat normally do in a wild environment? Um, and should we not be tapping into those rather, trying to tap into those rather than the things that we might be interested in? And this touches on an issue that um, we've talked a lot about in, in Sidby and with many people around is that is one of face validity. And that is that the model that we generate should look like the human syndrome. And we separated from, the humans separated from rats 70, 80 million years ago, and they went off on their own way of evolution. Rats adapted to the environments that they would want to be in, so did mice, that they, that they evolved in. Typically for mice, dry arid plains, for rats, swamps and trees, they, they evolved behaviors that were appropriate for their evolutionary context. These are very different from the behaviors that humans have evolved in. So the behaviors might look very different, even though the underlying circuit biology, the use of the medial prefrontal cortex, the use of fear conditioning um, or fear uh, circuits, these, might, these are tapping into the same circuits. We know that from MRI imaging and from um, and from electrophysiological recordings, but the outward expression of the behavior might be very different. So the problem with using these is they were devised, these um, traditional ways of behavioral testing are devised to tap into things that we think are important for the disorder, rather than how the disorder, thinking about how the disorder might present or the same genetic um, alteration might, prevent, might present in a rat or a mouse or a zebrafish for that matter. The other problem with these tasks or what can be a problem has to be very carefully controlled is the, um, it can be confounded by the emotional state of the animal. So as I mentioned, we typically take the animal from its cage and then put it into the task. We know very little about what that animal was going through in the cage prior to it coming down. So it may have just gotten into a fight with its cage mate, for example and it might be in a highly stressed state. We don't know that when we're putting it into the animal and this can confound and change and question the reliability and reproducibility of our results, which is why some labs may get 
one result on a behavioral test and another lab may get another, they might be running the behavioral test the exact same, but because of the nature of the animal house and the way the animals are living, it will place the animal in a different emotional state. Um, and it can also be confounded by the experimenter. So we've known for a long time that there tends to be differences depending on whether there's a male or female that's actually running the experiment. Um, but also whether the, what is very key is whether the experimenter is confident in handling the, an, handling the animals and comfortable with the animals or whether they're not and whether they're stressed out because that passes over to the animals. And just like the emotional state of the animal, that will change as the, with the emotional state of the experimenter. So what would be ideal is if we could run these where we know what the animal prior history of the animal is, plus we can as much as possible remove experimenter bias. So we spent a lot of time thinking about this in SIDB and how can we possibly mimic a natural environment of the of rats? So to do that, we really need to understand a little bit more. And this is what I referred to back at the beginning of the talk on why rats. We know a lot about rats and how they live. So they live um, in these complex burrows and tunnels underground. They um, live in large social groups of up to 150 animals. They have very complex social behaviors. They hunt together. Um, their, their sexual behaviors are very complex. They form hierarchies where there's dominant animals and submissive animals. They have a complex communication using ultrasonic vocalizations and smell. And it, so they have a, developed a very complex social environment. And one of the really important, interesting things is there's been several studies from Oxford that have showed if you take laboratory animals and you take them, the commonly used strains like the Long Evans hooded or the Sprague dollies, and you place them back into a wild environment, they will express all of these behaviors. So nothing has changed in these animals since they've been dom domesticated um, for the last 50 to 100 years. All of these innate behaviors are still there. They, ju they just need an environment to express them in. And so with all of these things in mind, we developed something known as the habitat. Um, so we were trying to come up with a way where the animals could express all of these complex social behaviors, spatial memory, associative memory behaviors, where we could look at motor coordination, circadian rhythms, and their reaction to novelty amongst a few different things. And one of the other things I should have mentioned is one of the things that rats do during development is they develop a very complex play behavior. Um, we believe that this is very important from other people's research in developing resilience um, in, in, in the rats in their social hierarchies. And um, this is something that rats have that mice really don't display. So again, if we want to touch into these developmental play behaviors, and, and the use of USVs and understanding how they communicate, we really needed to move to, to rat models to do that. So this is what the schematic that was initially drawn up looked like. You can see it has these trying to mimic the burrows. It has these series of tunnels. It has ladders that they can crawl through um, and they can go up, they can go in a range of different levels and they can, um, we can put up to 50 to 60 animals and still be in home office compliance within the habitat. This is what it looks like in reality. Um, so we can film all of these animals. We have camera points where we can film them. Here's the little ramps that they can go up to get vertical access. They, they can dig. Um, they have lots of tubes. This tube goes between two, be across the module to, to, to attach these two. We have short tubes and we get easy access to them in case of fighting that we can stop, et cetera. Oops, I keep tapping that. And each of these modules, well, not, uh, we hope to have each module, but right now we just have ultrasonic vocal um, detectors so that we can get a broad understanding of what vocalizations are being used while they're in this habitat. So here's very preliminary data. So we've had a, one group of Syngap rats go through, and in this case, um, we have wild types, we have the gap domain deletions, we have the E8s. I would say generally overall, it's very difficult to tell what's a gap 
uh, what's a syngap heterozygote from an E8, their overall general behavior going um, of they can climb, they can do everything that the wild type do. And if we look at the total transitions between different modules of the habitat, there's really no difference between the wild types, at least in this first cohort that's gone through. In this case, there were 21 animals placed in the habitat, seven wild type, seven gap domain deletions, and seven E8s, which are the full deletions. We can start to see hints that they may not be um, identical. So if we look at the amount of time that they want to spend on each floor, we can see that the Syngaps spend most of their time on the bottom floor. So they, they, while they do climb and they do go up even to the top floor, they spend very little time on the top, on the top floors. Um, if we, when we put them in the cage, we put them in the in, into the habitat, we put them in the bottom, and we say, how long does it take for them to get to the top floor? You can see that the syngap, the latency to the top floor, the syngaps, both the gaps and the E8s, really take a much longer time to get to the top floor. And this is the maximum time. So these animals up here have never reached the top floor. Um, in the four hours that they're in there, they just have not reached the top floor. This is on day one. And if you look at day two, more of them are going up, but still four of the gaps still don't go anywhere near the top floor. So we're starting to see differences where perhaps we don't know why this is, but we're starting to see differences in their general behavior where they really don't like spending time in the top floors. We're very interested because this, one of the main advantages of using the habitat, and I should have said, Right now, the animals go in for four hours a day and they go in for consecutive days. This is not what we want. This is not why we built the habitat. We want them to live in there, but we had to show to the ethical review board and the, and the home office that give us our licenses to do animal work that the animals wouldn't fight. And I'm happy to report that in these preliminary experiments, not only the Syngaps, but none of our models fight as long as we give them time to habituate with just their cage mates to it by when we put them all in the full 21 and we've gone up to about 35 animals we see very little evidence of fighting but we do see this um apologies for the spelling mistake this should just say antagonistic behaviors these are behaviors that animals do to set up their hierarchies so we see animals sort of fronting one another and standing up and boxing each other and they try to lift their nose above the other one to, to express dominance. We can see these little skirmishes where one animal will pin the other and we can see wrestling. And while the animals don't do it a lot, they're, they're in these, um, each day they're in there, they're in there for 1600 minutes or four hours, or is that right? Uh, four, 2400 minutes. Um, they spend very little time doing these actual behaviors, right? But they still routinely do them as they set up these as they set up these hierarchies. Um, and what it looks like is the syngaps in this first cohort. The syngaps spend more time boxing, doing the boxing behaviors, the, at least the gaps. And again, this is one cohort, so I don't want to make too much of it. But it does appear that they spend more overall time in the antagonist, doing these antagonistic behaviors. And we we can now start testing whether they actually form differences in their hierarchies. Are syngaps more likely to be at the top of a hierarchy because they spend more time doing these? Do they spend more time doing the antagonistic behaviors with each other? Or do they spend more time doing them with wild types? These are all things that we can now start to address in terms of how they, um, and how they behave. And we have a lot of predictions on this, as I'm sure um, you might as well. Um, but we are, I should mention that we are at the stage now, come uh, May, we're going to be able to start allowing the animals to grow up. We've gotten the permission now, so we're, we're going to start allowing the animals to, from weaning to grow up in these habitats. So the last bit, I'm not sure how I'm doing time-wise, I'm probably going way over. It's been an hour already. Um, so I'll just quickly run through the EEG sleep, if that's okay. Would you like me to keep going and see the sleep and seizure? 
Yeah, yeah. What I'm seeing is that people are utterly fascinated, and you're going to get hit with a lot of questions. But okay, but please keep talking. This is this is lovely. Okay, okay. So the, in terms of sleep and seizure, we needed a way of properly look, seeing seizures. So for the first, I would say three years, we had the gap animals. We did not notice that they were having seizures. And in the next slide, I'll show you examples of that, and you'll immediately see why. So here's a cage of animals, the long Evans hooded. These are long Evans hooded for obvious reasons. They have this black hood, which is how they got their name. And I just want you to watch um, this video. Turn off the sound, there's no need for that. So watch this animal in particular. Do you see what he's doing? That little head bob. You'll see it again in just a second. There he goes again. Now he's gonna stand up. He'll have a little head bob and he falls back. So in that case, it actually made him fall backwards. He has one more and that's really the, the, end of, the end of the video. So you can see in that short clip, this animal had four of these seizures. And the reason we um, didn't notice these is these animals only have these form, what we believe are a form of absence like seizures. They only have them in quiet wakefulness. So we never saw them when we were running them through their tasks. We only saw them, Sally Till, a very good postdoc in the lab, noticed these when she was upstairs with the animals in the cage. This was before the habitat. But we assume we would have seen these on the videos in the habitat. And we have seen some since um, in the habitat. So Sally just looked behaviorally and said, are these seizures or these absence like seizures associated with the Syngap genotype? Because at that point she didn't know. So these are how we sort of score them, um, these various features. Um, and she just said, of 23 gap domain um, deletion animals and of 18 wild types, how many animals in, in the wild types or the knockouts gave, gave um, these seizures? And of the ones that showed seizure, of the, wild, of the Syngap animals, all of them showed this form of seizure activity. In the wild types, only one did. So one out of 18 versus all of the 23 in the initial cohort she looked at. So this made us feel confident that these were associated with the deletion of the gap in the C2 domain. We now know that we also see them in, in the full deletion heterozygous animals. But we needed to make sure that these were seizures. And for that, we had to go to the EEG and um, to see if we could record epileptiform activity in these animals that corresponded with the seizures. And we did see that. And I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. So the, the, the system we use is something that, the, what's nice about the EEG is it's non-invasive. And what we can do is we can stick a 32 um, channel, or in some cases, 16 channels onto the skull of the rat. And these can either be tethered to a recording system or what we have up and running now, and you'll see for the sleep scoring, animals that have a telemetry system that send the signals back to a recording system um, so that the animal can be freely walking around and doesn't have a long tether to, to the actual electrode. And in this way, we can record out of 16 or 32 channels and really measure the seizures and how they spread across um, the cortical surface. And the same thing for the sleep. So here's an example of one of those recordings from a, from a Syngap rat. So here's those 32 electrodes that are placed on the animal. This is what one of those um, grids actually looks like. This is a tether system and you can see these long wires that have to go on, which can be quite cumbersome for the animal. It's very much easier in a rat than it is in a much smaller mouse. 
but you can do, but we've done the recordings in mice as well, and, and they are quite straightforward with both the tethered and the, and the telemetry systems. And these are the types of recordings we get from 10 of the, those electrodes. And based on the location of the electrode and which cortical region they sit above, we can associate the activity with a particular quarter, um, cortical region. It's not completely perfect because different elect the electrodes are close together and they'll be tainted by other ones. But what it can give us is a general idea of the spread of the seizures and, and where they're originating. And we're still analyzing all of that. I will say that these tend to appear in motor areas um, and sensory areas and then and somatosensory areas and then spread out from there to other cortical areas. Um, and we also have an accelerometer which is a so which can um, which is essentially measuring muscle tone and you can see it also measures when the animal is moving or in this case having a seizure and we can see the seizure activity happening here in this animal. So the first thing we obviously did was to say do the syn gaps show seizures uh, an increased prevalence of these the seizure activity or the what I hear is called SWD, these are spike and wave discharges, which are the electrophysiological signature of absence seizures. And this is just the proportion of animals with, um, with no seizures versus the proportion of animals with seizures by genotype. And you can see that the Syngap wild types, we actually did in some of the wild types, in a very small number of the wild types, see some of the evidence for some of these absence seizures. We see most of the Syngap animals do it. And this is over a four hour recording. We now know that all of these animals show it, but they weren't part of this in this four hour recording. And that's not true for the wild types. If we look at these animals and we look at how long are the seizures and how frequent are they, we can see that the Syngap animals show, again in blue, show much longer on average, or show a much greater number of these spike wave discharges. And you can see they show a much greater duration. When you look at them and you just plot the cumulative probability of their distribution, the reason why the blue curve is shifted to the, to the right is because they, the, the seizure periods in the, in the Syngap heterozygous animals are much longer or are longer. Okay, so we know that they're having seizures. Can we treat these seizures? And for um, in humans, for with having these um, absence-like seizures, one of the classic drugs used is ethosuximide. So we wanted to see whether we could block these seizures um, with ethosuximide. So what you see here is an this is the protocol. So we at the start we do nothing and we just get a baseline recording. We then give either saline or ethosuximide and record for the next period. We then do a reversal. We give the animal saline or ethosuximide. Um, so if the animal got saline here, it will now get ethosuximide. If it got ethosuximide here, it will now get saline. And we record afterwards as well. And we've done this in a wide variety of range of, of paradigms. All of the, what I'm showing you will hold true in all of those. And with between each period here is a 24 hour, well, this baseline, we do 24 hours. We also get a baseline just before the injection as well. So here's the untreated animals. You can see the syngaps, and I'm just showing the syngap data because these are the animals that were having the seizures at the time. You can see they're having a range in number. When we give the ethosuximide, we see no evidence of seizures in them at all. 24 hours later, well, um, you can see that they're all back to having seizures again. And in fact, there might be a slight rebound effect where they're actually having more seizures. Um, we can do a seizure index. So this is saying if we, for, so combining all of these together, if we do ETX um, versus pre-ETX, so that'd be this versus this, we can see that we completely block the seizures. This is post-ETX, right? So this, um, versus pre-ETX. And in this case, when we add all of the animals together and all of the different paradigms together, we can see that there's no difference. They, 24 hours either, later, they don't have more seizures than before. So this rebound effect that we saw in this first bit was sort of spurious when we add all the data together. If we do saline versus pre-saline, 
we can see that there's no decrease in the number of seizures. If anything, there might be more. We're looking into this. This might be because of the injection. And we do post-saline versus pre-saline. Again, we really don't see any change. So the ETX is having a profound effect on reducing the seizures in the Syngap animals. I'm not showing the data, but it has a similar effect in the wild type animals that do the few wild type animals that do show these spike wave discharges. Actually, we now know that as we look at old, the more older and older we look at the wild types, they do start to develop these spike wave discharges more prevalently. The Syngaps just developed them a lot earlier. And that's the age at which we're doing them here. This is at two to three months when typically we don't see many events in the wild type animals at all. Okay, so sleep, I'll just finish on sleep. So we, because we have the telemetry system now, and again, this is all very preliminary data. Um, Alfredo gonzalez Sulsar, who's running these experiments, um, nicely got them to me this week, but made me stress that these are preliminary. So we can look at the various types of activity in the different states of wake, non-REM, um, REM sleep, wake, and we can start associating, we can start dividing up how much time do the animals actually spend in these various stages of sleep or sleep more generally. And um, to first, to I need to get you to understand rat sleep a little bit versus human sleep. Humans, we typically get, when we go to sleep, we start entering into non-REM and REM, and that's got a very distinct pattern, but we typically solidly sleep on average for about eight hours, and we do that during the dark phase. Rats are nocturnal. They typically sleep during the light phase, but they, their sleep is often more, much more broken, much like cats. If you have a cat at home, a pet cat at home or dog, um, you'll notice that they don't sleep all the time. The cats don't sleep all the time during the, the light phase. Quite often they're up and moving around, but then it will be followed by a long bout of sleep. They just tend to sleep more during the day and they tend to be more active at night. They do sleep at night, um, but they tend to be awake more at the night. And this is just showing over the light phase of, uh, of a rat and the dark phase of a rat, how much time they spend in each of these phases. And just focusing, what I'm explaining to you is just the wake you can see that they're in wake a lot less during the light phase than they are during the dark phase, but they do have these periods where they're actually wake quite a bit during the light phase. This is the corresponding EEG for the rat. And you can see we get this very classic pattern and you can see the breaking up. This is a wake, the dark areas of the wake um, times. And you can see this is clearly the light phase where they're awake quite a bit, but they're just, um, they're, they're, they're not as long periods and they're, um, um, and there's, they're more, they're sort of about the same, probably about uh, as numerous, but they're, they're just quite not as long. Whereas during the dark phase down here, they just spent a lot long, longer sleeping um, or, and a lot less time awake. Um, so we can characterize all of these in the same gap rats. And again, you can see from the numbers this is quite preliminary. We've actually run it. We've run, we're now up to about 11 and 12 animals in each condition, um, but they're still going through the analysis. And I didn't, and Alfredo just broke this for me for the first four and five. Um, the person running the experiment still doesn't know the genotypes. So we can start looking at during the light and dark phases. Uh, again, the syngaps are in blue. The wild types are in, um, in the shaded. And if I just cut to the chase, if we look at the total amount of time in wakefulness, syngaps are awake more of the time, right? Even with this low N number, it's already statistically significant. Now this low N number, even though it's statistically significant, I would take it with a grain of salt. It appears that they're spending much more time in the wake phase, but as we add in the full cohort, and we always do that, to make sure this might normalize out. But as a starting point, it appears that, they're, um, that, th that they spend more time awake um, and less time 
um, in, uh, asleep in the REM phases. Um, if we look at the dark period, we can see that they spend more time um, they spend more time awake in the dark period and less time in the REM phases during the dark time when they'd normally be awake. Um, so I think with that, I, there is, I mentioned that I might talk about Lovastat and I'm happy to do that, but I'm very conscious of time. So I will stop there. I will thank all of this massive team that's, that's done that. I should point out, I've already pointed out Alfredo um, and um, his amazing postdoc that's been doing this, all this work, Ingrid Buller. We, this is all gonna speed up because now we have an automated sleep scoring right now. Ingrid has done all the preliminary data by hand, but she's checking it all with this automated sleep scoring from our Chilean uh, collaborators. And it looks to be working really well and really reliably. So we should now be able to just score sleep automatically and get the data very quickly. Um, Sally Till did all the fear conditioning. Um, Tanai Katsunovaki, who I realize I've left off the slide, did a lot of the, a lot of the behavior, all the object recognition. Um, and Alfredo and um, Ingrid also did all the EEG, but all of these people have been involved in, in the Syngap project and thank you very much to them. So with that, I will pause um, and I will answer questions. Wow, thank you, that was amazing. I, I'm, I've got all, I'm getting messages on various platforms telling me that people are intrigued and excited in the interest of time, I'm going to hit you with four questions really quickly, and then I'll let people come at us, um, if you don't mind. Um, I'm just going to wrap up. Right, I, along. I tend to do that with these Zoom platforms. It's very different. Um, so yeah. it was only 30, 35 slides, but uh, yeah. No, it was, it, was, it was magic. Thank you. So I'm just going to rattle off four questions quickly, and you can take them as you want. Question one, on the associative memory task, it's, it struck me that the OCR number was the one number that was sort of, the mean was below the wild type. And did that, and I'm wondering if that brought down the complex score and then related question, if, if that was a correct read, does that point to a specific brain region that was particularly affected? It's a, it's a really good question. So yes, what we've found in the Syngap animals generally is they give us more variability. They did, they reached criterion, so they were actually statistically above chance, and they were not different statistically from the wild type animals. So from a statistic standpoint, they are not different from wild types. We're looking, you can analyze all of this data in, in, in multiple ways, and one of the things we're looking into now, because your hunch is absolutely right, it looks like some animals aren't doing it but some animals are perfectly able to do it. And I think what we're seeing in the syngaps, which I alluded to in one of the um, phenotypes, is that there's an increase in variability. So it's not that all the syngaps can't do it, but some syngaps don't do it. And we don't know whether that's because of this issue of attention, that they just show a lack, a de general decrease in exploration. And that's a really hard thing to tease out but it could indicate that there's a problem with the attention centers of the brain and their connectivity to the regions I mentioned, like the medial prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, and, and the lateral entorhinal cortex. I'd be very, it's one of the things I really want to talk to Gavin about, who's also interested in these different regions and how we would start really teasing that out. Okay, great. Question two, I think I heard you say that you have two models. One is a C2 gap domain deletion and one is a full knockout. Yeah. And, and that you mentioned that the C2 gap deletion has the structural functions because the, does that mean that the, 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 the two ends are both there? So it has a structural ability, but not the enzymatic ability. And so two points there. One, can you just elaborate on that for parents? The, the, this idea that, that Syngap has structural and, and enzymatic function, just, just like one double click. And then I want to point out, I'm aware of one patient who has almost exactly that mutation. She's a mm -hmm. big old deletion in the middle. And relative to the population, 
pretty high functioning. I, I, I don't know if you're aware of that patient, but I'm, 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 I'm not, that would be very interesting actually. Happy to connect you with, with that. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. So of course, what determines final um, outcome in a, in a, in a human patient can be is multifactorial and you can't necessarily make a direct genotype phenotype um, correlation. So there's, and I, I probably stated that I went through that very, very quickly and there's caveats to the, to the statement I made. So what we know about the gap domain, C2 gap domain deletion is that it's present in the same amounts as the wild type allele. And it gets to the synapse in the same amount. So if we do a postsynaptic density prep, that gap domain deletion protein is at the postsynaptic density. Now that's that needs to be contrasted a little bit with the type of things that Mary Kennedy has shown in terms of the structural func structure functions of Syngap. Um, and the things that in terms of mopping up other PSD proteins, because Syngap is so abundant. Um, and the type of things of the phase transitions that Rick Huguenier and others have talked about. Um, so can I say that that those functions, the ability to mop up and the ability to go through phase transitions, no, we haven't tested that, but we have no reason to believe since it's locating that those functions would be perturbed based on what we found because they still have the PDZ domain function. They still have the structural architecture function, um, but they lack the enzymatic function. Um, so that is what would be predicted from what we've made and the fact that we know that they get to the synapse. Um, we're currently doing, um, we're currently looking at the, the complex in more detail, the structure of the complex in more detail, and we're doing pull downs to see if they still are associating with things like the NMDA receptor. But I think it, how, what, how that is actually affected um, will we wait, await those studies. Great. Okay, I'm gonna, a couple of things on the habitat. Um, the first question, and this is all trying to think about how I, how I see Syngapians behave. Did the Syngap pets and EEHs have a preference either for each other within their subgroups or the other Syngap mutants versus wild types? Like, did they get along better with the Syngapians? Question one. Question two, is, is, is one reason you're considering that they didn't make it to the roof, they just got tired? I mean, one of our, one of our symptoms is hypotonia, right? Our kids get tired, and if you had yeah. to climb up, Question three, whoever saw those absence seizures, yes, they get it. I've always been struck when I meet postdocs looking at animal models who've never met a human with the disease. Um, but that's exactly what many of our parents and their clinicians, frankly, deal with. People yes. miss these seizures for too damn long, if you'll forgive the expression. Um, but related, have you tried triggering seizures with oral motor stimulation, which many of our kids have? And what about noise? And both those questions Sarah Morris mentioned in the chat. And then the fourth point on the habitat, would the ethics committee at the home office let you do like a panda cam where we could just log in on the internet and watch? Because parent, you could crowdsource probably a lot of insights from parents who might love this. So is it, okay, so can you go back and give those to me one at a time so I don't forget? Did the Syngapians prefer to spend time with each other? Because we do see that, oh, I see that in the yeah, we don't know. So we're, we've been measuring a lot of things of the interactions of, of Syngaps. One of the things that we're currently, and it's still going through the analysis, is um, allo grooming. So how much time do they really spend grooming one another? And we don't have that data yet. It's still being scored and everybody's blind. So I will come back to you because I think that's one of the things. You might expect them to show less antagonistic behavior, but actually there's a lot of data to say that the antagonistic behavior is really to set up the hierarchies and, and is a form of social interaction that shouldn't be seen as detrimental. So it doesn't lead to fights, for example. So I think it's how we interpret that behavior as well that's important. As soon as I have that data, I will let you know. So I would say the, the the first cohort that goes through it. So keep in mind, one of the problems with the habitat, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but one of the limitations of it is we put all these animals in there, 21 animals, but for statistical purposes, the N is one because it's one cohort going into the habitat. 
So we need three or four cohorts going through before we have any statistical power to say that. The third, the second SYNGAP cohort is going through and in the next two months, the third and fourth will go through. So it'll be a little while before I can answer these with any in any definitive way. But I wanted to show them to you as, because it's always good to get feedback like the hypotonia and is this, is it a motor thing? I can tell you that the gap domains on the rotor rod look pretty normal, but the E8, the full deletion show a deficit on the, that. For the most part, the gaps and the E8s um, look very similar on the tasks we've done so far, but there's a few that are different. And if anybody wants to look at all that data, I'm happy to show all the data we have from the Bangalore pipeline that is a direct comparison of the gap in E8s. The E8s is falling a little bit behind because we had the gap model first. And all of the behavior from the gap is now in this, um, it, we, we're trying to get published now um, and is on the bio archive. The E8 is a bit behind publication, so we don't have the full data set yet, but eventually we'll have that to compare. Great. Okay, so you just talked about the hypotonia. That was my second question. The third here is kudos on the absence seizure catch. Any, any Have you considered looking for oral motor stimulation as a tying back to the human? Yeah, we've wow. just started looking at that. One of the postdocs in my lab is just um, going off to try to get his own lab. And his entire thing is looking at oromotor function, oromotor um, hyperexcitability in the circuit. So I should say altered sensitivity in the oromotor in the circuit um, in, in Fragile X and Syngap. So that's his main research focus or will become his main research focus. And he's just started doing these types of experiments to get preliminary data. So okay. we don't know yet, but it's a, it's a great idea. So just a couple more, Panda Cam. So we've been thinking about how, because we have, um, as you can imagine, we've, we've had, I think six different lines go through the habitat. And each we have, for most of them, we have eight days of recordings, four hours each. So we have 32 hours of recordings. <laughs> and currently we have a whole army of undergraduate students doing it, but we've discussed something like PandaCam. And it would be great if, if, if people were interested that the most difficult thing for this, it depends on at which level. We're happy to have PandaCam to, for people to observe the animals. You have to remain blind and the way we recognize the animals is because they all have a number on their side. Mm. Okay, So if you saw something, you'd have to write in and say, I saw this. So if you just wanted to observe them and say, and look for interesting things, we're happy to do that. Um, if we, if, if it was, if anybody wanted to get involved in actually helping score, right, actually doing the scoring, you would have to be trained on the software, which is all commercially available. And we have, I have an amazing postdoc who I should have mentioned, um, Angie Harris, who's led this whole project. So I should also mention Ollie Hart, Oliver Hart, it was his brainchild, not mine, that uh, came up with the habitat. And Angie has led the, and overseen, I think now, 12 undergraduate students and, and about an equal number of master students to do all this scoring. We could train anybody who wanted to, because it's pretty straightforward training to do the scoring um, for these individual behaviors, which would obviously speed things up immensely if, if, if people were interested. And that could all go through that. I would check, I'm pretty sure we would be allowed to do it, um, but I would, I would need to check with the, um, the university and the ethics approval. Um, but because this, one of the main reasons we devised this was for to improve ethical treatment of animals so they could live in a proper habitat. Um, sim more similar to what they're ethologically relevant. The vets love it and they're, they're here and they're thinking about starting it and it's all home office compliant. So I, I would think we might be able to do that, but I would need to check. Yeah, we should talk about that, it could be fun. Yeah. I'm gonna throw two more at you. Sleep, the, the, on the sleep issues, absolutely. I think once, Parents get seizures under control, or if, if, if depending on how bad they are, the next two things they deal with are behaviors and sleep. Um, 
So are you, I don't know, if, I'm sure you're aware of it. But I don't know if you've read that paper by Shilpa Kadam and behavioral psychiatry. I think it's behavioral psychiatry. Yeah. Um, but she, she observed in there that a lot of the seizures were clustered in that, I think it was a mouse model she was looking at and some human data, that the seizures really clustered around the sleep wake and wake sleep transition. And I couldn't tell in your slide if, if that's what was happening there. So I sort of alluded to that, that the, the, we always see these in, when in quiet wakefulness right before sleep. So we never see them in the, when they're actually asleep. We, we don't see them in um, non-REM and REM, at least at this point. Whether the automated analysis will pick some up, we don't, we don't know. But the vast majority of them are when they're in quiet wakefulness, about to go in transition into sleep. Um, we never see them when the animals are actively awake, which is why they typically happen in the home cage and we never see them in the, um, when they're doing a task. So when they're attending to something, we don't see them. The other thing I'll say is we have seen in a couple of occasions um, and the 24 hour monitoring will help with this if it, if, it's, if it is a real thing. Occasionally they transition into a full tonoclonic. Right. But, but not often when we're watching them. Which is what we see in the population, right? We see a range exactly. of, yeah. Um, so if you, if you turn to the Q&A, Gavin's hit you twice and Thomas has reinforced Gavin's second question. People actually are very interested in the low, the statins. Okay. Um, so should I, uh, really quick, I don't, um, let me quickly show you some data. I can give you the summary very quickly. So let me start sharing again. And this is not, I will, one form is I'm not gonna talk specifically about Syngap um, in the sense of, but it's, it's a little bit of a, a, of a warning that because we find one thing in the hippocampus, don't assume it will translate to other brain regions, which is why back to my original thing. So these were the two papers that we've published on Lovastatin, the one that everybody here will be familiar with, I think, um, that was from 2015, I think it was, that um, was a, from a combination of mine and David Wiley's lab, where we showed that the hippocampal pathophysiology in terms of the LTD phenotypes of the plas synaptic plasticity could, in both Fragile X, which Mark Barr had shown previously with Emily Ostwell, and Syngap could be rescued um, by um, Lovastatin. Um, and in, and the basal protein synthesis, deficits um, or increase in basal protein synthesis. We subsequently published in Fragile X, and I mentioned that these animals show the object place context, a big deficit in object place context. We showed that we could get sustained correction with lovastatin treatment. If we treated, treated lovastatin from four to nine weeks of age, um, when these animals are developing, um, the, the ability to do these tasks that even if we remove the lovastatin later, we could get a permanent recovery um, of that, of the object place context um, task, their ability to do this associative learning. Um, now, the Syngaps didn't show that, so we never went on to test that in the Syngaps, but we really wanted to test in the Fragile X animals how general this was. And the one thing I want to point out, and I think it's really important to discuss these things with family groups, is in nowhere in these titles did we mention lovastatin, because much the way we use lovastatin is as a way to tweak the ERK pathway to try to understand the bi biochemical pathways. We didn't want to highlight this as a potential treatment for the disorders. And I highlight that this is a classic way that Re translational research has gone. We go from gene to mouse to therapy to clinical trial. And I really would advocate for a much more complex model where we spend a lot of time, we go to gene, we go to multiple species, we try to cross validate, we spend a lot of time doing this. We use, we try to understand the biomolecular mechanisms, understand circuit dysfunctions and go back and send them. And eventually when there's consensus, we go for targets for therapy and go into clinical trials. The showing lovastatin works in one brain region um, to correct a particular phenotype, I don't think 
is a reason to immediately rush to here, even though I know that there's a gigantic desire for that. Um, so we, in looking to see, to trying to get at what, when we do these drug treatments, what is actually being rescued? And we started this in Fragile X. All of the Syngap animals are now going through an MRI study very similar to this. We look at we looked at the fMR1 knockouts versus wild type animals in the default mode network. So this is basically looking at this is this is the network that lights up in humans when you're not really doing anything, you're not doing a task, but you're just self-reflection, you're thinking. So you're not asleep, but you're just thinking. Um, and you're recalling different aspects of the day or whatever. So if we look at the default mode network, what we see, and I'm going to really whiz through this, is that there's greater activity, there is a reduction of activity, so this is wild type greater than knockout, in the wild types versus the fragile X rats, okay? We can look at that in using these sorts of correlograms, and the brighter the image, the more functional connectivity. Now, this is not the number of axons or anything like that, it's the way that different brain areas come online together and activate together. So it's the functional connectivity. And you can clearly see that the fMR1 show this decrease in functional connectivity. So we can study this over development and we can see how this emerges over development in the rats. And we, can, we really see this coming online in 15 week old rats, that this, the connectivity slowly increases over development in wild types, and we just don't see this same level of increase in the fMR1s. So what happens when we treat our animals with lovastatin over the exact same time frame that we, um, over the exact same time frame by which we treated to rescue that OPC deficit, right? And you can see that knockouts on lova do not, the global connectivity as measured by the resting state is not rescued. We still see in this other cohort of animals, the difference between the wild types and the knockouts, but we do not see um, the, the rescue in the resting state networks. So we're not sure exactly what the rescue is in, in the fragile X that's allowing them to behave on the OPC to form the associative memory it might be that they're compensating by using different circuits. It might be that they're that those particular those particular brain reg, um, regions we've been able to tweak the circuit function at least to a degree that they can do the OPC task. But if we challenge them even more with associated memories, they would not be able to do it. The one thing I will say about SYNGAP, and I think I'm finishing there. Yeah, the one thing I will say about SYNGAP is that. Um, Sally has tried, has done a preliminary study. It's not powered well enough yet where she's tried to rescue the fear conditioning with um, lovastatin. And lovastatin does not appear to rescue the fear conditioning, that, that inability to, um, uh, to lose the association between the, the light and the shock, that there's no extinction phase um, the, 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 there's no extinction phase in the syngaps that um, were treated with lovastatin. So lovastatin does not appear in the syngaps to rescue the alterations that we see in the fear conditioning. So I realize that might be a bit disheartening, but that's what the data is currently tell, telling us. One more question from Zainab, and then I have one more for you. Um, she asked, do, would you expect that the fear conditioning could kind of suppress the seizure phenotype? Or in other words, formation of fear memories would suppress the seizures? So I can, can you ask that again? Yeah, and if you click on Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom, okay. you can also read it if, if okay. that's easier. But would you expect that the fear conditioning could kind of suppress the seizure phenotype question? Or in uh, other words, yeah. So we're currently doing that. Um, Sally is currently giving the esosuximide um, at various points. So if you do it after the after the um, fear conditioning, 
Um, but before you give the um, before you um, before the animal can consolidate, or if you do it the next day, just before the um, the the recall phase, and we're also doing it with the seizures um, and sleep. So I don't have the answers to any of those questions yet, but I will have them hopefully in the next three to four months. Brilliant. It's a great question. Um, I have a broader question for you. We see a lot of patients yeah. start their, their diagnostic journey with functional microarray or whatever it's called, microarray for fragile X. And then some people say, oh, it's not fragile X. It's not, and, it's, and, and they stop there because in the early years, our kids present like fragile X. And I realize a lot of these NDDs present the same, but there seems to be something there in terms of how similar they are because a lot of clinicians go to it fast. Is that just because clinicians have heard about fragile X longer? Or is there some reason to believe that people like yourself who have such a deep knowledge in fragile X can leverage some of the learnings or techniques for same, like how much should we as a group of parents doing everything we can to try to accelerate research in the hopes that there'll be a therapy for our kids in, in, in a time frame that matters. How much should we be paying attention to what Mike and the team at Fragile X have done and, and learn from them and, and look for researchers like you who've done Fragile X to leverage what's gone before? So the first part of your question, I, I do wanna actually, before I ask you a question, there is one thing that I really wanna say because I don't wanna give the impression that to go to clinical trial, you should wait all the time, you should wait for consensus in the field. I, I think the decision to go to clinical trial is one that should, and this is what the, with the model we've adopted in the Patrick Wild Center, and hopefully Andy mentioned, when we went to clinical trial for the MGLUR antagonist and Fragile X, we decided that there was two main stakeholders right? There's really three because you have the pharmaceutical companies, but they want everybody to go to clinical trial. So the two main stakeholders are the family groups and the researchers. And we had a long chat with the Fragile X. We have a very good relationship with the Fragile X community about whether we should go forward with these clinical trials. And lots gets taken into account. Safety is, is the primary one. Is the drug safe? Is the research safe and everybody's allowed to pitch in and we only go forward, both sides have a veto on whether we go forward with the trials. Um, the drug companies don't get a veto unless they pull the trial. So um, so I think the, the, it's really a balance between safety. If a drug is known to be safe, then I think you can go forward to clinical trial without being absolutely convinced by the research. But then it, it should be we should be very open that we're going through because it's a safe it's a safe pharmaceutical and not because the underlying science is so overwhelming right the science takes unfortunately a really long time so to get consensus in the field that 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 to to go to clinical trial i don't think it should always hold back clinical trials but it should certainly be one thing that's considered in terms of going forward for clinical trial, if there is. And I've seen this happen in Fragile X, where things have gone forward to clinical trial because one lab finds something and, um, and it, before it's even published, that goes forward to clinical trial. And then when it actually gets published, no one can repeat it, <laughs> right? And then they say that the mouse model or the rat models are bad. It has nothing to do with that, it had to do with that the science wasn't so great. And we rushed forward to clinical trial, spent all this money on a clinical trial that shouldn't have been done. Um, I don't, I think a lot of it is what you said. Although the caveat is I don't spend a lot of time with either Syngap patients or with Fragile X kids. I've met a lot in my time, but I am not the clinician. That's a really good question for Andy. My guess though, is that Fragile X has become the go-to because it was one of the first disorders, monogenic disorders found. And a lot of these different disorders, the initial presentation is similar. Yeah. So it's the go-to thing. Um, so if you're not presenting with massive seizures, then the go-to will be Fragile X, right? If there are a few seizures here and there, but the seizures actually are much more likely to develop over time, 
So CDKL5, for example, is rare, very unlikely to be diagnosed as fragile X because one of the first things you tend to see in CDKL5 is the seizures. But Syngap might be more in that category where you, it might get diagnosed as fragile X more. You would, uh, you would know more about that uh, than I do. Um, what can we learn from Mike? I think what Mike and the fragile and, and Fraxa did that was amazing was these small grants, right? And we actually adopted that in Sid B. So we, um, and actually way, way back when we formed the Patrick Wild Center, we said, how do we get, we don't have a lot of money, but we have a bit. How do we get people to work on Fragile X or Syngap way back? And we went to the researchers and said, what is the bottleneck for you to not do what you do, the beautiful work you do, why aren't you applying it to our models? And they said animal costs. So we paid the animal costs. It was five to 15,000 for them to do a pilot grant. We said, we'll pay them, you do it. And that's how we got people interested. That's how we built up a portfolio of people working on these monogenic forms. And that's eventually what you know led us to being able to um, to apply for the Simons money and really dramatically expand. That's actually interesting. We, we just had, a, we've had a series of meetings where we, we ran into two researchers and two companies who all said the same thing to us inside of three weeks, which is now we need to build a humanized mouse because we have some genetic therapy that we need to test a regulatory mechanism that's in the human gene and not the murine gene. Yeah. And I was suddenly like, oh, this is great. So now we're going to have a couple mouse models running around and a bunch of university MTA departments and corporate lawyers spending forever arguing with everybody else who wants one. And they're all going to just spend the next X months and Y dollars building the exact same thing. Right. So we're in the process of, we're about to finalize a, um, a contract with someone to build a humanized mouse that has the whole human gene in it. And we're just going to give it to any company or any researcher or any lab who wants it. Okay. For exactly that reason, because we're our, I don't care who makes a therapy. Yeah, exactly. We just need it done, right? I completely agree. And that's why we have a very open policy with all of our rat models. We give them away because we just want the research being done. I think that's the future of, of this science, right? Yeah. Uh, we can't be protective of these things that we built, these tools to understand the disorder. We have to make them available to the community immediately mm -hmm. or anybody who wants them. And it, it's interesting, if it was useful, we could try to build a, a humanized rat if that was useful um, mm -hmm. through our pipeline. And um, so it would, be, it would be interesting to see how you're doing it in the mouse and we could consider doing that in the rat. I'd be more than yeah. happy to. Uh, it's, that's it's, it's, it's a back, I'll send you the, I'll send you the, the proposal. It's pretty fascinating. For, and I don't know anything and I, so maybe it's not that fascinating for you, but it's, it seemed cool to me. Yeah. Um, with, with that, we've really imposed on your time and I'm grateful to the 20 people who stick around and thank you so much. As I said, the, for me, this is one of the most important things that I do. So I'm more than happy to come visit you whenever I, whenever I can. And I, hope it was, I hope it was helpful. I hope it was interesting. It was, it was. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.